Hey, what's up, everyone? This is David Greenspan, and you are listening to the Mindshare Podcast, a proud member of the Industry Syndicate Media Network. Additional podcasts are available at industrysyndicate.com and mindshare101.com. This week's episode is sponsored by Kits Keep in Touch Systems. This is episode 30. So the other day I'm speaking with somebody on the phone and, well, they essentially use this line to me and they say to me, old people don't use email and millennials don't read paper. Or at least that's how I summed it up. Now, this was what I thought was real interesting. As I sat there thinking about that and I thought, you know, there's a lot of misconceptions out there around how people market themselves, what they're doing out there to get more business, what's working, what's not working. And why is it that people think that old people are not using email or millennials aren't reading paper? Like, where did this come from to begin with? So I had to do some digging. And in true Mindshare 101 style, and that's what Mindshare 101 is all about, I like to bust myths. I like to take what you guys are talking about, listen to it, really interpret it, try to take it, research it, um, try to make sense of it all, and then I try to feed it back to you guys as an audience because I think that a lot of people think a lot of the same ways, yet a lot of it, again, are misconceptions around what is and what is not working. So as I did some digging on this and I thought, well, okay, old people don't use email and the ladies don't read paper. Well, let's go figure out if this thing's true. And what I ended up finding out was that 76% of millennials surveyed trust paper more than digital ads. And that's coming right out of Forbes. We even found that 87% of millennials like receiving direct mail. Now, that's a stat coming out from the U.S. Postal Service. I then even found out that out of the average five hours a day that baby boomers are spending on their smartphones, 43 of those minutes are spent on email. And what I thought was really funny, which I'm, this is sort of a Canadian statistic, but the top 10 most admired companies by millennials coming in at number six is the one and only Canada Post, which is our postal service up here north of the border. Now, number one was Google, number two, Shoppers Drug Group, number three was Microsoft, number four, which I thought was pretty interesting, is Dollarama. We've got Netflix at number five. We've got Canada Post at six, Amazon at seven, Canadian Tire at eight, Sony at nine, Samsung at 10. And what I don't see on there is anything about Apple, iTunes, any of that stuff. And well, if you listen to me a lot, I still wonder why anybody's using that stuff. But I know that most of you are, so I love you. Anyways, when you look at that list again, it's interesting to think about the stats that we're learning about millennials, the stats we're learning about the usage around smartphone devices and technology from, from the, the sort of baby boomer generation. And then we look at the most admired companies to think that Canada Post is sitting right there at number six. This is amazing. This is what you call busting myths. And again, in Mindshare 101 style, that's what I like to do. And for those of you that, you know, maybe just started listening to this podcast, first, I want to thank you. And I want to thank everybody that's been listening to the podcast. Um, Mindshare is really uh, a top of mind, intuitive, instinctive reaction to a product or service. This is where we are trying to get your name on people's minds. And quite frankly, that's exactly what I try to do every day. Um, through my Mindshare 101 videos, through this Mindshare podcast, through my Mindshare challenge, um, all the Mindshare 101 content is really out there to help you, my audience, the people that I work with, the people that I love helping succeed. I want to help you guys build more Mindshare. That is my goal every day, to take your name, and plant it in the, in the minds, in the hearts, in the brains of everybody who's come in contact with you, everybody who knows you, everybody who's done business with you. I want to really help you get there. And the more we can plant your name in there, the more we can create that intuitive, instinctive reaction so that when the, the word, the topic of real estate comes up, when I think about my house, I think about you. That's what Mindshare is all about. And so when we think about who we're trying to build Mindshare with, there's really two audiences of people we're trying to build it with. We've got the people we know and we've got the people we don't know. And most of our business on a regular basis is coming from the people we know. 
And we know that. In fact, almost 70 to 90% of our business comes from there. And for those of you who are shaking your head right now, maybe saying, no, I see more of my business come from the people I don't know. Well, to you, I would love to know what you're up to. I'd love to know how are you bringing in more business from strangers? What kind of marketing budget are you working with? What kind of tools do you have in place? You see, because it all comes back to money. We get up in the morning, we go to work, we come to work, and we do it so we can make money. And hey, if you're filthy rich and you're just doing it for the fun of it, well, then good on you. But I know most people that I speak with, including myself right here, I am doing it so that I can earn a living, uh, provide for my family, and then go out and enjoy life and do the things I really want to do. So when we think about money, it's really how much money do we have to spend on this stuff? How much money are we going to put towards it? And then what kind of ROI are we looking at? And we also know this. When you're getting those leads online, those, those strangers that are coming in, those people that don't know you and you don't know them, we know that there's a whole nurturing and conversion process. And again, it takes more time and it takes more money. It takes more effort. And if you just meet one new person every single day, I said this to you before, it's 365 new people a year. That's quality people. Now, I also will tell you, for the amount of time we've been doing what we do here at Kits, and we've been doing this about 13 years now, We've been working with thousands of realtors. Uh, We've been helping people keep in touch with their contact lists. And so we've seen many contact lists and we've gotten to know many of our clients very, very well. Well, with that, we've gotten a sense of when your contact list is within an average of about 200 to 700 people, you're making an incredible living. In fact, all you have to do on a regular basis is focus your time and your effort on that contact list. Which means making your phone calls, going and seeing people, connecting on social media, sending emails, you know, doing the things that are very valuable to a relationship. And this is not just business stuff, but this is focusing on the right group of people. And when you're doing that, you can keep your costs down, you can keep your ROI way up, and now you're making a living off of a really solid book of business. And you are now working easier, you are spending less, and you are making a whole lot more. So it really comes back to the two audiences, which one are you focused on? Now, when we look at the, you know, the strangers and the people that we don't know and the people that, again, I I just mentioned, you know, they don't know you. Well, this is where this whole idea and and this sort of a marketing when we say ADA, which stands for attention, interest, desire and action. But ADA, this is where it comes in. And we've always got to think about, again, when I talk about the dollars involved and, and really what you're doing out there. How does ADA fit in to my entire marketing process, especially with the people I don't know? Well, again, attention, interest, desire, action. The first thing is you need to get attention. And how do you get attention from people? Well, there's really only one of two ways. Number one is you've got a listing that they're interested in. Or number two, you're marketing the shit out of them. Like seriously, you're creating content. You're putting out value. You're doing this across social media. You're doing this across email. You're doing it across direct mail. You are doing it on your website. You're, again, calling people. We're creating content that people can gravitate to and possibly, maybe, have some interest in. Now, if they do have interest, where are they going? Well, typically speaking, and as we all know this, you should have a landing page somewhere that people can go to. And once they land on that page, again, why are they going to go any next steps? Why are they going to give you information? Are they able to get what it is that they wanted right from going to your site? Or do we need to create a little bit of a desire? Do we need to give them something to desire, which is probably what drove them to the site to begin with? But we want to know they're there. And we don't want to just know that through this random Facebook pixel, which, well, not random Facebook pixel. You can use the Facebook pixel, and they work great, and especially for remarketing, which I love for building Mindshare. But it's that desire to get their information, to get an email address, to get a first name and possibly a last name and add them to a list and be able to remarket these people, not just through Facebook or maybe Google, but now to be able to do it by email. And then to be able to extend that, and since you're in real estate, you definitely want to figure out where they live, well then to extend that into getting a physical mailing address. So starting to really build this book or build this profile around this particular contact in your book. So you've got to have that desire. You've got to have that lead magnet, that that something that they're going to sign up for. Well, let's say you've done that. You've created the attention. They've gone to your site, they've got that interest, there's now desire to get something from you, so they're going to give you their information. Well, now here we are with the action step. 
And the action step, again, is we've got these people. They've gone to our site. We've, we've driven them there. Everything's working. We've got these people. We're now going to move these people into our CRM. Well, what happens? Action. This is where we've got to have action plans. We've got to, again, have ongoing marketing. And this is across all channels, not just email, but your social and your direct mail and your phone calls. And I can't stress this enough. And, you know, that combines your hustle. Because it's not just the stuff that goes out there on an automated basis, but this is also the stuff that, well, we connect with each other. Like, you're grinding. You're working hard, right? And that is the meeting with people, the making the phone calls, the doing the text messages. That's the hustle. The marketing happens in the background. The hustle happens in the foreground. And the more of that that you do, especially with all these new people, well, now we've turned mind share into market share. And now you're making money. Well, here's the deal. What do you do with those people? Well, naturally, again, when we talk about the two groups of people, we've just taken these total strangers and we've moved them into a group of people that we now know, like, and trust. They are in our CRM. We've hopefully done some business with them, but at least they know us now. Now, what do we got to do? Well, relevant, ongoing marketing. We've got to continue to push that message out there. We've got to continue to build the mindshare with them. We've got to continue to remind them that we weren't just here for the initial deal, but we are there to actually earn their business, earn their referrals, and be there for them down the road. Because what you're trying to do is create that list between 200 and 700 people that are going to be your raving fans. And so there's the process around going out and really trying to attract strangers and bring strangers into your business. And again, I can't stress enough when we're talking about, you know, the strangers and we're talking or, or, or the people you know and the people you don't know. Again, most of the time, the people you don't know are not bringing in the same amount of business to you that the people you know are. And it, I, I want you to think about this, right? Every time you meet somebody new, and I just went through eight of it, every time you meet somebody new, the goal is to take those people and transfer them into the contact list. So they're going from group number two, they're now moving into group number one, and you are now building that profile, you are building that relationship, you are putting them in your CRM for your 10-year plan, and there's now going to be an ongoing plan in place for how you're going to continue to build the mindshare, and at some point, again, earn the business or earn the repeat business, or even earn the referral. That all comes back to putting them in the CRM and then work in your CRM. Now, the big question always comes up of, oh, what's the best CRM? Which one's the best one out there? And there's always that common debate, and I think that everybody here has heard it like a broken record. The best CRM is the one that you are going to use. There is no CRM out there that's just going to automate everything for you. And if it does... You're totally disconnecting yourself from people you know. You're totally letting a robot, a system, get in the middle of a relationship. And, well, turn the tables here. Imagine I put you onto a CRM and I never got in touch with you and all I did was automate everything. And how much of a relationship would we really have? So, again, CRM is not there to disconnect you. It's not there to automate everything. CRM is there to help you keep, to help keep you organized. And there's three pillars of CRM, okay? This is what every CRM should have. There should be a contact list. There should be a calendar. And there should be marketing. So again, a contact list, calendar, and marketing. And you're probably sitting there maybe rolling your eyes going, well, (laughs) geez, that wasn't like, you know, rocket science. And no, it's not. But a lot of the time when you sit there going, yeah, my phone is my system. I use Google as my calendar. My contact list is on my phone. I'm asking you, where's your marketing? Oh, I use, uh, you know, this program over there. And I use that program over there. And I'm thinking to myself, well, where's your book of business? How are you actually building your business? What's your retirement plan? How are you getting out of this business down the road? Have you even thought about that? You see, having the right contact list, adding people into the list on a regular basis, adding one new person every single day because that's 365 new people a year plus all the other people you, you know, go and, you know, go to their stores and you buy product from them and people that you do business with and friends and family and, you know, all the the people at the doctor's office, your hairdresser, all those people need to be on the list, right? But they got to be in the right place. They got to be in a place where you can build that profile, where you can track notes about what you talked about. I don't care if it's business or personal or both. I bumped into them at the grocery store, market down. These are the notes. This is building your book and that is what is saleable down the road. Now that you've got the contact list 
And we think, okay, well, I've also got a calendar. Well, again, if your contact list and your calendar are not attached to one another, then again, where are you tracking the history? How are you scheduling ahead to stay in touch with these people? And I mean, it's one thing to be able to say, well, hey, you know, if the contacts are on my phone, I can schedule those people in my calendar in Google. Okay, cool, convenient. Where's the notes? Where are the notes of all of the history you two have spoken about? Where are all the life events? Where is the automation to the marketing that is happening in the background delivering the business message while you just continue to build the relationship? So you need to have your contact list connected to your calendar in one spot so that there's always that push forward. Again, remember, this is a 10-year plan. Think about real estate. Think about, pardon me, your marketing the same way you think about tell or the way you tell people to think about their real estate investing. Again, a long-term plan. So now we've got the contact list in there. We've got the calendar in there. We're staying in touch with people on a regular basis. We're doing the hustle. Well, the third pillar is the marketing. And this is where, again, there is some stuff that happens in the background. There is some stuff that automates in the background. And, guys, um, I, I know I did a podcast around this in, in um, earlier episodes, so go check it out. But there's only seven ways to communicate with people. And to run through those real quickly, you've got in person, you've got by phone, and you've got a text message. That's your hustle. Then you've got the direct mail. You've got the email. And, by the way, they say we, we receive, like, over 120 emails a day, which almost, like, 50% of that is spam. Wow. So direct mail, email, and then social media, and then website. So again, the seven ways to communicate, the top three ways are up to you. The bottom four ways are kind of, you know, they can happen in the background. But I want to focus on what I started this with around old people don't use email and millennials don't read paper. So I want to focus for a moment on the direct mail channel because as I sit here today, especially to, you know, speaking with you, my audience right now listening to a podcast, chances are as you're listening to this podcast, you're probably on the up and up with tech. You're probably all over your social media. You probably like listening to podcasts and ebooks and watching videos. So you're probably thinking to yourself, well, paper, is this guy out of his mind? Why would he be pushing paper? It's 2019. Hell, 2019 halfway done. It's almost 2020 which is kind of scary to think. But this is where I come in. Mindshare 101, busting some myths for you. Because I think this stuff's important. I think you really need to think about this, okay? Direct mail is the only form of your marketing that is going to connect with somebody's home. Remember that. And response rates with direct mail? 45%. Email is only 19%. On a website, it's only 10%. Why? Well... Think about the way the human brain works. Think about the way every single one of our brains work. We've got three levels of our brain. We've got the neocortex, we've got the limbic system, and we've got the reptilian brain. And so the neocortex is really that outer level, that bigger, newer, outer level. It's what controls all of us making movements, walking, talk, uh, well, walking and talking and, and, and running and moving our hands and moving our feet and, you know, all the, the sort of motor skills we have. The limbic system controls our emotions, whether we're happy, whether we're sad, whether we're freaking angry, freaking angry. Whether, uh, you know, I don't know, my hunger, my drive for sex, care for my offspring. The limbic system controls our emotions. And then we've got the reptilian brain. And the reptilian brain is the instinctive brain. And what did I say about Mindshare? Mindshare is a top of mind, intuitive, instinctive reaction to a product or service. So it's the reptilian brain that we really want to tap into. Because we can show people a bunch of pretty pictures and they can look at them. They can open them. They can, you know, sort of if it's a magnet or an email, whatever, they can look at it. You know, the emotional side of things, it'll trigger certain things. But then there's that instinctive part, that, that part that really causes you and I to either say yes or no, to either keep going or to stop, to feel comfortable or not to. That's the deepest, oldest part of our brain. And that is essentially what you're trying to tap into. So forget about all the BS you hear out there about what works, what doesn't work. Start to really think about this as a human being. Start to really think about this as you right here. Forget all the hoopla that you hear. 
Ask yourself, how do you react to certain things? What triggers certain senses? What triggers certain emotions? What triggers certain reactions? When was the last time you went to your mailbox? How quickly do you sort through your mail? Oh yeah, real quick, eh? And you're throwing it all out? I got you. Okay. How quickly do you sort through your email? Oh, just scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. Haven't got enough time because I get too many of them. So are you telling me that you just passed by an email or you deleted it or junked it quicker than you did that with direct mail? And by the way, email, you know how many spam filters there are between when I send an email to when it gets to you? I mean, there's my filters, your filters, there's your, our network filters, there's you know probably a, a number of other filters that, are, that it's going through. Like, chances are you're not even seeing all the email that gets sent to you. But that being said, again, we're sorting email quicker than we're sorting paper. With email, we're only touching one sense. With paper, we're starting to touch the physical, we're starting to touch the emotional, we're triggering people on a different level. And if we're trying to dr- drill deeper, well, you can't just start, you know, if you want to drill a hole, you can't start halfway down. You got to start from the top and you got to start to drill or dig or whatever. So if you want to get from the top and you want to get right down into that instinctive reaction, you've got to start from the top. And that means, again, triggering certain physical senses that cause you and I to create certain reactions, to, re- to do certain things, to, to elicit certain emotions. And so this is why um, up here in Canada, we've got Canadian Tire which is a place that, you know, they sell pretty much everything, Um, you know, garden stuff and car stuff and sports stuff and and, and household stuff. And, you know, they've got it all. You got to get patio furniture. You go there. You you know, you got to get a new tent. You can go there. Uh, You got to get, you know, uh, garden stuff. I mean, you name it. They've got it all. Car stuff, oils, whatever. So Canadian Tire creates this flyer, this this printed newspaper flyer that comes out every single week with all of their different, you know, stuff that's 50% off and save this and, you know, red hot deals and all that stuff. And, (laughs) you know, as a society, part of all the flyers we receive every week in our in our uh, newspapers, this is kind of that one that at least for me as a father, as a as a as a guy, I look forward to this one. And I know a lot of people that sort of, you know, a lot of other guys and, and, and girls and, you know, it doesn't matter what you are there. But um, there's a lot of people out there that go, oh, yeah, I love the Canadian Tire Flyer. Well, they've been doing this on a regular basis for, for I don't even know how long. And then what they also did was last year they came out with this thing called the Wow Guide. And this was a spring, summer type of magazine that went out that just, again, a printed magazine that they were going and they were uh, promoting different things in the store and really trying to drive people because they understand that people are going online. This was to drive online sales. Well, check this out. Canadian Tire reports that online sales doubled because of this WOW catalog. So they took a printed piece of marketing. They sent it out to somebody. They tapped into those different layers of the brain. They then sent people online to do their shopping. And online sales doubled. Now, another example here is IKEA. And the IKEA catalog is is something uh, incredible. Uh, They published to over 70 different countries. Um, They published over 200 million copies last year, which uh, actually comes out to being more new copies published in a year of the Ikea catalog than the Bible. And again, Ikea spends 70% of their marketing budget on this catalog. It's incredible. They are spending 70% of a marketing budget on a paper catalog, and most of their sales are now happening online. So again, paper is triggering an online purchase an online reaction. It's getting somebody to a website. It's eliciting a sale. So it works. Now, there's this other company here, and um, I'm not sure if you guys have heard about it. Uh, it's, uh, you know, a smaller group, but uh, they're doing some pretty uh, innovative things. Um, and they, uh, well, they're called Facebook. <laughs> well, they just came out with a brand new lifestyle printed magazine called grow. So Facebook is in the world of print. Interesting, right? Facebook. Go think about that one. And I mean, I'd argue that Facebook just knows a couple things and they kind of know what's going on out there. And 
It's kind of scary because Facebook knows everything. So Facebook's use in paper, it's got to tell you something. Um, now there's this other company called uh, Google. Uh, Google? <laughs> Google has me on this intense direct mail campaign happening like right now. I'm getting a postcard from them every single week. And what they're doing is they're trying to get me online to use their Google AdWords service. So essentially what they're saying to me in this direct mailer, which is addressed to me, is David... We will give you $150 towards the $150 you put in for Google AdWords. So if I spend $150, they're going to add $150. I'm going to have $300 to spend. Now, they're delivering that message to me through direct mail. And again, like Facebook, Google, they know everything. Now, here's another one, and i got to be careful how loud I say their name because they might just show up at my door any second now. Um, and that, If that didn't give it away, Amazon last year actually used a printed catalog to drive online sales for their holiday toy list. So again, they, it was this ultimate wish list for kids. They printed the whole thing. They sent it out to people. And the goal, I mean, it's Amazon. Where are you going shopping for Amazon? Amazon.com, Amazon.ca, whatever. Amazon.com forward slash holiday toy list. So they're sending people this paper magazine, this paper uh, catalog, and they're going, look at all the stuff that we've got. Now go online and buy it. And again, this is Amazon. The last three companies I just labeled off, literally Facebook, Google, and Amazon, all using direct mail. So I have to once again ask you, why do you think this doesn't work? What, what made you think that? Oh, well, Dave, you know, it's expensive. Expensive compared to what? In fact, I'm going to talk to that in just a second. And I mean, this is why I've been doing this now for the past 13, 14 years for realtors and mortgage brokers across North America. And we've got the most kick-ass direct mail money can buy. We use variable data publishing. I mean, we're not even just sending, you know, one size fits all. We're doing everything where it's highly personalized. So, I mean, it's totally customized and branded to our clients. But then every single letter is highly personalized to every single different contact based on a whole bunch of different data sets. And so, yeah, you've got those different profiles in your contact list that we talked about, your CRM. You know who all these people are? Well, let's talk to them like you know them. I mean, if you're a potential client of mine and I treat you like a past client, I mean, it might mean like, you know, we're cool together and all that stuff. But the reality is you're kind of looking at me going, man, I've never done business with you. And totally flip side, if we've done business together, but I treat you like a potential client and, and you are a past client, you're going to look and go, Dave, do you not even care that we did it before? Or maybe you're just a family member, a friend of mine. And I really don't want to try to sell you at all. And what kind of house do you live in? What's interesting to you? Are you an owner? Are you a renter? What holidays do you celebrate? What language do you speak? The more we know about a contact, the more we can get into that top level of the brain and start to drill down from the top and then become that instinctive reaction. And I mean, we've done some wicked stuff with this where, you know, the shapes and sizes change every month. We put yellow post notes in there sometimes that are totally personalized to people. Um, we put this thing in an envelope, we put a real stamp on it, and you might be going, so it's a real stamp? Well, yeah, nine out of ten of us open a piece of mail because there's a real stamp on it. I mean, we've got these calendars where we put people's names in them. And I'm talking your client's name on every picture engraved into the image. So they're not keeping it because it's a calendar. They're keeping it because it's got their name. And now what have you got? You've got 365 days of wow factor. 365 days of easy mind share. And you know these people are going to show it to people. It's got their name on it. So again, there's a lot of place in, in our world for direct mail. There's a lot of uh, advantages to using it. And like I said before, direct mail is the only form of communication from you that actually connects you with my home. Now think about that. You are selling real estate. You are, pardon me, you are helping me buy and or sell real estate for a living. So when it comes to real estate, you should know where I live. You should know what my house is like. You should be able to give me information, value add information about my home that I can look at and go, yeah, that was great. So you need to know where I live. But you also, again, want to get me thinking about you. And when we talk about that instinctive reaction, that mind share, you want to get me thinking about you every time I think about my house. So why wouldn't you be sending mail to my home? Why wouldn't you be trying to connect with me at my home to create that instinctive reaction? Why? Oh, you know, Dave, uh, people tell me they don't read the mail. <laughs> really? But they tell you they read all your email? Or they tell you they read all your social media? 
Or they tell you they visit your website once a night before they go to bed because, you know, it's comforting. Come on, guys. How often do you like watching TV commercials? I've got PVR at home. I barely watch any commercials. In fact, sometimes when we haven't recorded something or I'm watching the game, it's like, oh, man, commercials, right? And you know what I'm talking about. Thank God for PVR. Radio commercials. You know, ads on social media. I mean, I could go on and on and on and on. I think you get my point, though. You are trying to connect with somebody's home. Nobody wants any of your marketing. But the point is not whether they want it. The point is, what are you trying to do to build your business? Are you going to be out there more than the next person? In fact, here, here's the flip side. Yeah, go ahead. Curl up in a ball. Hide in a quarter. Well, you're doing that because, you know, my clients don't really want that much. Or, or you know, I feel bad. Or I don't think they need to see me that often. Well, guess what? You're going to have like 10, 20, 100 other competitors who are out there who are bombing your people, who are, who are just like wildfire going after all of your clients. And next thing you know, they're chipping away at the block. And they're starting to earn some of that business because they're working harder than you are. Don't let them do that. Be there. Be in front of people. And yeah, if somebody says to you, hey, you know what? I don't want to get it anymore. Ask them why. And if they say to you, well, you know, because I just throw it out and I don't read it, you know, you're wasting your money. Remember this. To send a piece of paper to somebody, it's about $15 all year to pretty much do it monthly. A valuable piece of information for $15 that'll put you in their mind so that when that time comes, you're the agent they think of. Now, you tell me what your ROI looks like. And how I said off the top, it should be a 10-year plan. Think about it like like you think about real estate investing, long-term plan, right? The 10-year plan, over the course of a decade, you're talking 150 bucks. So I'm still going to come back and say to you, the ROI is higher than anything you could do out there. Well, not necessarily anything. I mean, we look at email and we say email's got 122% ROI, and that's an easy one to think about. Why? Because, well, email's cheap, it's cheery, it's free. You can blast a lot of people every single day if you want to. So yeah, naturally, with no cost to that, it's going to have a much higher ROI. But direct mail's not bad. At 27%, I mean, anything above 20% is not a bad number. Hey, we'd all like 100%. But I mean, at 27%, that's not a bad number. Now, when we look at social media, social media coming in at 28%, you might go, well, social media is higher than direct mail. Yes, but by a point, like literally 1%. Social media gets you a 28% ROI. Direct mail gets you a 27% ROI. Now, when you want to come back to cost around that, we know that the minimum, minimum ad spend you can have on social media in a 30-day window is $500. Now, if you're doing that on your own, then $500 is probably the number. But if you've got somebody who's helping you with that, well, all of a sudden you're going to jump up beyond your ad spend of $500, add another $500 to another $1,500 for management of that account, which now takes you to somewhere between $1,000 to $2,000 easily for your social media ad spend. Whereas when you want to come back to having, I don't know, 200 to 700 people on a contact list, I'll tell you, for 500 bucks, you could probably keep in touch with about 375 of those people, no problem, by direct mail. So again, from a dollar's perspective, direct mail is not as expensive as people make it out to be. It hasn't got that big cost that everybody talks about. In fact, it can be a hell of a lot more affordable than your social media. And I'm going to argue with social, like I've done many times before, that if you haven't got your organic game stepped up and you're not doing the things you need to do on a regular basis then social media ad spends are really not going to do as much as you want them to do anyways. And beyond the social media, remember, come back to Ada the way I explained it. You've got to now take that social media ad, drive somebody somewhere so that they can give you their more information per se. You've got to get them into a contact list, continue to market to them, continue to hustle to them. You are talking to a bunch of strangers. You've got to nurture and then convert those people. And it just takes time. It takes money and it takes a lot of support. Again, something like direct mail. Not that it can be the be-all and end-all of your marketing, but something like direct mail is out there to support those other channels, to bring you to life, to get into that deeper part of the brain. And I want you to know something. Consumers have a 70% higher brand recall when direct mail is combined with a digital marketing strategy. Direct mail is making your marketing 70% more engaging. It's building more mindshare. 
and mind share equals market share. So what should you guys do next? Well, here's the thing. First, I'm going to remind you, uh, for those of you that haven't yet, please visit mindshare101.com. There you can get your free ebook called The AMH Theorem. This is going to allow you to go through all of your marketing, all of your budgeting, and really analyze, am I speaking to the right audience? Am I using the right channels? Do I have the right plan? And am I on budget? So again, audience, marketing, hustle, AMH theorem. This is something I advise all of my mindshare challengers and all of my coaching clients. They do this every three months. So at the end of each quarter, we are getting prepped for the next. We are doing a review of our AMH, and now we are staying ahead of the game, and that's why people continue to win. The next thing I want you to do is I want you to review. Are you using a cross-channel marketing strategy? Okay. Think about your marketing that you've got out there right now. Are you isolated to just email or just social or just phone calls or even just direct mail? If you are, it's not enough. You've got to use all of them. You've got to use the right mix of the active touch points, the phone calls, the texts, and, 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 and meeting people, and a mix of the passive touch points, the stuff that happens in the background, like the direct mail, the email, the social, and the website. Do you have a cross-channel marketing strategy in place? And finally, I do invite you all. For anybody who's got any questions, who wants to know more about how to build Mindshare, who wants to know more about uh, how to join the Mindshare Challenge, again, you can get a lot of information at Mindshare101.com, uh, but I also encourage you, reach out to me. Get in touch with me. Let's engage. Let's talk. Let's, let's look at your uh, plan, your marketing. Let's see what you're up to. I'm here for you, and I thank you. So you're either listening to this on iTunes Google Podcasts, Stitcher, or Spotify. Or maybe you went to industrysyndicate.com or even mindshare101.com. Wherever you like to consume your content, please rate, review, and subscribe. And if you haven't yet, connect with me on Facebook at Mindshare101 and on Instagram at David Greenspan 101 This has been another episode of the Mindshare Podcast. Thanks, everyone, for listening.